This morning's Bible reading comes from the book of John, chapter 4, verse 4 to 14. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flock and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will come in me a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So let's pray for Gillian before she leads us in uh, the message for this morning. Lord, I thank you for Gillian. Thank you that you have gifted her with the ability to communicate your heart to us. And Lord, I pray that as we, we hear the words, that we won't hear Gillian, that we will hear you speaking to our hearts. In Jesus Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Karen. So today we're starting a new series called Like Jesus. And today the theme is to live like Jesus. Now, I don't know how well you think you're doing at becoming more like Jesus, but have you ever thought what it means to live like Jesus? As disciples of Jesus, we're seeking to become more like him every day. And we know it's going to be a lifelong journey, which is different for each one of us. Sometimes we might be doing really well and we grow quite quickly. Other times it can be slow, a slow slog, but we're heading in the right direction. Each one of us would have a different story to tell. So what does that passage that Claudia just read tell us about what Jesus was like? Well, one thing it tells us is that no one was unreachable to Jesus. How often do we as people think, oh, I'm not going to try talking to that person about Jesus because they're so far away from living a life that is meaningful to God We'll wait until they're living a better lifestyle before we talk to them. Anyone ever thought that? Yeah, a few nods. I know I have. But Jesus wasn't like that. When Jesus came across that woman at the well, it was an amazing thing that he did. She was a Samaritan. Now... The Samaritans and the um, Israelis were total enemies. It involved racism, it involved real hatred, it involved them having different belief systems about God. They were just total enemies. And people would go out of their way not to walk even through Samaria. They would walk a long way round to get where they wanted to go simply because there was no way they were going to step into that country. But Jesus knew on that day that he needed to go into Samaria. Where he was actually going from, he could have easily um, bypassed Samaria. But he knew that was where God wanted him to go. He 
he could have done his own thing. But we know that Jesus did what he knew his father wanted him to do. How well do we do at doing what we know our father wants us to do? It's a real learning process, isn't it? Sometimes we know what we're meant to be doing and if we're, you know, sometimes it needs a bit of courage and we can do it. Other times we know that we just chicken out and think, oh, someone else will do that. Now, the place that Jesus went to, Sychar, was about 30 miles north of Jerusalem. And it was about halfway between Jerusalem and Nazareth. And the well that he met the woman at was called Jacob's well. Jacob was Joseph's father. And he'd actually dug that well, which amazed me because it was, it's more than 100 feet deep. I've no idea how back in those days they managed to dig a hole so deep. But the well is there. It's still there today. And it was an essential thing in Samaria because there is no river in Samaria. There is no fresh water in that land. Now, the women would normally go to the well either early in the morning or later in the afternoon when it was cool. And the well was a place where women would gather to talk as they filled their water pots. Now, we don't know for sure why this woman went to the well at noon. But it could be that because she lived an immoral life, she wasn't liked by the other women, and it was just easier for her to go at a different time so she didn't get all the flack that was directed at her. She wanted to go when she would be alone, but not on that day. She's at the well. Jesus comes along and says to her, can you give me a drink? Well, apparently it was custom in those days for people to travel around with a, like a bucket and a rope so they could um, go to a well, get their own water, refresh themselves and keep going. So she's looking at Jesus thinking, well, where's your bucket? How are you going to get that water out of this well? And of, he'd been traveling with his disciples, and it's probable that the disciples had gone off to buy lunch, get the food they needed, and they had the bucket with them. So Jesus is there with no bucket. Now, for Jesus to ask the woman for a drink was a shocking thing to do in those days. First of all, he, by custom, shouldn't have been speaking to a woman. Secondly, he shouldn't have been speaking to a Samaritan woman. And so he was going, definitely going against the flow in what he did. It wasn't as if the woman had said to him, Sir, you look like a Jewish rabbi. I'm hungry to know your God. Can you tell me how to do that? She certainly didn't raise the conversation. She was just going about her daily business, minding her own business, when this complete stranger asked her for a drink. And then in the later part of the, uh, the section in the Bible, which we didn't hear, the conversation is steered into spiritual matters she wasn't seeking to know God. She was feeling guilty over her current living boyfriend and her five marriages, which had probably ended because of her multiple um, adulterous situations. And that caused her to definitely keep a distance from God. The only explanation for this story is that Jesus was seeking a sinner 
that wasn't seeking him. A bit like, as I said earlier, we can look at people and think, oh, they're nowhere near coming to know Jesus. We'll leave it till later. But Jesus saw the true situation. What does that mean for us? Well, it means if we want to be like Jesus, we shouldn't be ignoring the people that we think are unlikely candidates for salvation. And that when we're talking to people or when we have opportunities, we shouldn't steer away from mentioning our faith and mentioning Jesus. We never know when the right time is for that person. We never know if on one day I spoke to somebody and then a few days later, Geraint meets the same person and says something and then a bit later on Jane talks to them and a whole succession of people talk to them and then one day it all clicks in their head and they say, I want to know Jesus. If I don't do my bit and Geraint doesn't do his bit, We're not allowing that person to make their decision possibly at an earlier stage than they might otherwise. It might be that there's someone sitting in here now who has had a really, what we could call a notoriously sinful past. I don't know a lot of your backgrounds. I don't know some of your names. Could be that somebody in here doesn't know Jesus. But we can learn from this passage of Jesus that every single person is somebody that Jesus wants to know, wants to get to know, and wants to be the saviour of, and wants to walk next to them through the rest of their life. Now, we're not here to force the gospel on anybody, which is what, unfortunately, we do see happen sometimes. But what we are called to do, and is what Jesus did, was to show compassion to people, to be a listening ear, to show wisdom when talking to somebody about a situation and to have a gracious approach to whoever we're talking with. God can give us the right things to say to people if we let him. I've learned over the, the last few years particularly that if I feel God is talking to me, I just have to be obedient and follow and pass on the message. Years before that, I might think, oh, is that God saying something? Isn't it God saying something? And a lot of the times I would think, oh, no, I'm not going to try this. I might be wrong. Take courage if you think God is saying something to you and share it with the person. You never know what effect that's going to have. Now, Jesus offers all sinners the gift of living water. Now, that living water, as I said, is a gift. It's not something that we have to earn or qualify for. We don't have to do a course before we can have that living water. Jesus spoke to the woman and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, because Jesus was speaking to this woman at the well, he focused his conversation in the context of water. In the previous chapter, Jesus had spoken to Nicodemus and he talked about being born again. This is say the same thing. It's offering someone eternal life. And Jesus used different pictures 
that were relevant to the situation and who he was talking to. Now Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water I give them shall never thirst, but the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. It's a gift, not a reward for living a perfect life. Now, one thing that people often make a mistake in thinking it's the thing we have to do is that we're going to get into heaven by good works. Now, every religion apart from Christianity operates on the principle that you must work for or earn your salvation in some way. Biblical Christianity is the only one where it is a gift. And how good is that for us that we don't have to work for that? It's not, it's a gift, not a reward. The gospel isn't good news, and that's what gospel means, good news, if it requires that we must do penance, reform our life, keep a bunch of rules, do an unspecified number of good deeds, and hope that someday God might let us into heaven on that basis. But it is wonderful good news that God offers it to us as a free gift. And that is what he does. But maybe you're thinking, well, I know I've committed so many sins. I've done so many things wrong. I'd be too embarrassed to make that known. I'm not worthy of such a gift. Well, that's right. None of us are worthy. But no one is excluded from the offer of this gift. When Jesus was crucified, the thief that was on the cross next to him, on the next cross to him, um, spoke to Jesus in his dying moments. And Jesus said, today you will be in paradise. We don't know all the details, we know very few details of that man's life, but in turning to Jesus on the cross, acknowledging the situation, and he was granted eternal life. Now, going back to our woman at the well, as I've said, just being a Samaritan excluded Jesus in the eyes of most Jews, as did the fact she was a woman, but being an immoral Samaritan woman ruled her out totally. But Jesus took the time and the initiative to talk with this woman about the living water. He didn't exclude her from offering the gift, and as I've said, he doesn't exclude you either. Actually, it's often good religious people who exclude themselves from receiving the gift. They're proud of their accomplishments and want some reward for what they've done. They don't want to associate with people like this sinful woman or admit that they need the living water from Jesus just as much as she did. But the gift is freely offered to notorious sinners and to self-righteous religious sinners. They both need the gift. Now, the living water that Jesus offered the woman satisfies our thirsty soul for eternity. Once we've become a Christian, we've opened our heart to God, that thirst that we often feel in us beforehand, obviously it's not a physical first where we can drink a glass of water and we're okay. First inside of us is that deep longing, that deep knowing that something is not right inside us. When we are filled with that living water, it may be that, as I said earlier, we're doing really well. The flow of that water is doing, is moving us on. Other times it might flow quite gently. Our lives do go up and down, but it's always there. 
Now, in Israel, um, it's a country that frequently experienced drought. And people were keenly aware of the water sources and water quality. Springs and rivers that ran all year were very few. So the land relied on cisterns to catch and store the winter rains and wells to tap underground water tables. In Jewish culture, dead water referred to standing and stored water. Living water referred to moving water, as in rivers, springs, and rainfall. This water was precious because it was fresh, because it came directly from God. It was used for ritual washings. Now, this distinction between dead and living water explains why the woman of Samaria was so perplexed when Jesus offered her living water. As I said, Samaria has no river. And if Jacob had to dig a well there, how could Jesus be offering something far superior? How could he be offering living water? And Jesus went on to explain a bit more to her that it's not a matter of rituals and ceremonies, but becoming a Christian is an inward personal relationship with the living God. Now, this picture of the living water then that's springing up points to the continual source of life that the indwelling Holy Spirit supplies to believers. When we have drunk from this living water, we're satisfied in the sense that we know he's rescued us from sin and judgment. He's given us eternal life and that nothing can separate us from his love. We're his children, and we're under his loving care in every situation. He's given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have his word, which is like water to our soul. Now, we still hunger and thirst for righteousness. In one of the Psalms, it talks about our hearts panting after God like a thirsty deer is looking for water. We still pray, as it said in Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So how do we get this living water that Jesus freely offers to all? Well, quite simply, we need to know who Jesus is, what he offers, and ask for it. Now, that doesn't mean to say we have to go off and do a three-year theology degree and learn everything about Jesus before we can say, Jesus, I want to live my life for you. We need to know almost the bare minimum of what Jesus has done for us in dying on the cross for our sins and then being able to offer us that salvation. This woman needed to know something about the one who claimed, he, who claimed that he would give her the living water. Now, faith is not a blind leap in the dark. As I've said, to have faith in Christ, we need to know something about who he is. What else does this story tell us about Jesus? Well, the fact he was tired and thirsty shows that he was human. He could have done a quick miracle and, you know, given himself a lovely drink to quench his thirst, but he didn't. He asked this woman for a drink. He was willing to drink out of her bucket, her container, which was yet again something that Jewish men certainly wouldn't have done. He was going to her level, not expecting her 
to come up to his level. He was being real with her. She asked him, are you greater than our father Jacob? And of course the answer is yes, Jesus is much greater than Jacob. And the answer to where he can get the living water is that he has it within his own nature to supply it to as many sinners as ask for it. It's an endless supply that never, ever runs out. And so to receive this gift of living water, the woman and everybody else just simply needs to ask for it. Jesus said to her, if you would have asked, I would have given it to you. But to ask, you have to recognize that you're thirsty and that you can't satisfy that thirst by yourself. But if you come to Jesus and, set, and ask, he'll give it to you. All you have to do is drink and drink of him until you are satisfied. The only condition that Jesus states is, ask. If you ask, he'll give you an endless supply. So have you asked Jesus for the living water of eternal life? Do you have the evidence of being satisfied with Jesus? We can continually drink from the world's sources, but we get thirsty again. But one drink from Jesus and you'll never thirst again. So why don't you ask?